गुड मॉर्निंग लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन नाउ वी स्टार्ट द नेक्स्ट सेशन द इंट्रोडक्शन विल बी गिवन बाय मी Uh, this topic is little different from the other topics. This is merely concerning uh, off-label use of drugs. Uh, this is very pertinent, especially in the present scenario of the uh, litigations and all those which are uh, prevalent nowadays. Uh, nowadays. Uh, there are no financial disclosures. The uh, co-chairmen are Mr. Jal Pariyar, Mr. Sham Sundar, Dr. Gaurav Kapoor, Dr. Sandeep Gupta, and uh, Colonel Avinash Mishra. Once you do a Google search, you will find that so many results are there regarding the off-label use of medications in the ophthalmology. What do we mean by off-label use? It off-label use means prescribing a drug or any instrumentation which is unapproved indication or in an unapproved age group, in unapproved dose or unapproved form of administration. That is a different dose from uh, which it is authorized. or different indication, different age group of different route of administration. Uh, the literature indicates that more than 50% of the ophthalmic medications which are being used are off-label. They are not prescribed, they are not as per the FDA approval of the drug controller. And in the pediatric age group, this figures increases up to 90% of cases. As far as the, uh, the financial implications are concerned, the annual US market of off-label medication is more than $44 million. Then the question arises why off-label drugs are being used and is gain gaining popularity. This is because of the increasing expectations of the patients. They want the newer drugs to be used for better uh, 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 usefulness or early recovery. These are cost effective because approval by the FDA and the drug controller, it involves a lot of money. And the companies, they try to, uh, don't want to uh, pay that money. That's why cost effective. And the clinical trials are less done, especially in the elderly age group, children and pregnant and nursing women. So off-label use of these drugs are done. Then another indication is exhaustion of all on-label options to treat a patient. When all the options are not effective, then off-label uh, use of drugs is done. Then it is also useful in cases of rare diseases where the sample size is very less and treatment of diseases with similar symptoms or physiology to the authorized indication. So why off-label drugs are uh, gaining popularity is many times off-label treatments are placed high in er every pharmacy. People, uh, many clinics, many doctors, they publish in newspapers that we are doing a new procedure which is not being done by others so that to attract the patients to their clinic. Then written about this in every magazine that I've uh, mentioned. And these are discussed in millions of web pages. Then people keep on asking on the media and the uh, Google, used by millions of people. And it is the fastest growing area of medical spending, yet they are regarded with skepticism by most doctors. 
However, the risk is involved in use of off-label off drug is when there is no surety about the scientific validity of the off-label use, then it might expose the patient to the unrestricted experimentation, unknown health risks, and if ineffective medicine. Sometimes serious adverse effects have been noted, especially a few years ago. All of us, we know that Avastin-related endophthalmitis had occurred and it went, there was a lot of hue and cry and finally the things were sorted out by the uh, Medical Council of India and the Ophthalmic Society. Then litigations are another thing. As far as the Indian scenario is concerned, the Drug Control General of India is the regulatory authority for granting approval for new drugs. And unfortunately, no clear-cut guidelines are available on the off-label use of drugs in India. The Indian law does not currently allow drugs to be prescribed for indications for which they have not been approved. Thank you. Now I invite uh, Sandeep Gupta to present his topic. What I'll be talking about is off-label drugs and NTF segment diseases. Again, uh, you'll find all our talks, there'll be a lot of overlap. Because this is a thing which has been happening from ages altogether. We've been using things which are not meant for what they're primary use for. And now the problem is the approvals. So as uh, clearly brought out, it is a use of a medication for a different indication in a different age group and different dose or route of administration once approval is given for a specific uh, condition. So, but there is a problem here. Now, once there is a FDA approval or a approval given for a drug for any indicated use, now there is, there is a line which says it may be legally permissible to use it off-label, may. So this is the point. Now the other, the flip side is, if the drug is off-label, you don't use it, and it is a preferred practice pattern, then not using that drug may be counterproductive for the patient. So we'll just discuss it once we come to the what, what all conditions I'm talking about. So these are the things which happen. Now, all of us are using topical antibiotics, corticosteroids, NACIs, antivirals, anti-glaucoma. The other routes, all these drugs are being used off-label, not for the indication they've been approved for. All of us use Vigamox, all of us use Zymaxid or Gatifloxin. Now, what is the indication where they've been approved for? They are been approved only for bacterial conjunctivitis, that too by susceptible organism. Now, all of us are using these drugs as monotherapy in corneal ulcers. If, if there is any cornea surgeon here, they'll realize this is monotherapy for small ulcers in periphery. We use it rampantly. Pre-op, post-op prophylaxis for cataract, LASIK, Keratoplasty, CXL, we all use it. This is actually speaking, legally it is off-label. But the other side is, it is part of PPP or preferred practice patterns from of more most of the organizations. So please use them. Otherwise, if you don't use them, there is a problem, you may land up in trouble. But technically speaking or legally speaking, it is off-label. Now all of us use fortified antibiotics. Fortified anti acanthamoeba treatment for bacterial keratitis or acanthamoeba keratitis. But if you see all these drugs, they are not meant for topical therapy. They are all off label. The PHMB, chlorhexidine, propanidine, whatever we use for acanthamoeba, it is not meant for acanthamoeba use. It is approved only for use in uh, different things, not in acanthamoeba. We prepare it, fortify it. We fortify it. Now, what happens? And Again, if you talk about antifungals, the FD approval for antifungal is practically mainly for netamycin. Most of the other drugs are again off-label. We are using voriconazole, we are, use, we are using concentrated amphotericin B in a lot of cases. Again, they are also off-label. Now, why there is a concern or issue about off-label use of fortified drugs? 
there is the issue about stability. The, whenever we fortify a drug, there is the issue about sterility. What concentration that we make is a problem. Now, concentration less or more may be toxic. The shelf life is suspect in all these drugs. And how to store them, these are the problems. That is the reason why it, you have to be very careful whenever you fortify any antibiotic. Now, whenever we fortify antibiotic, it should be done by a person who's trained for that, preferably under laminar hood in aseptic conditions. If not possible, we should not do it in our OPDs. We should do it in OT. Avoid using minor OTs for fortifying because you can always contaminate these drugs. And all these drugs should be labeled and storage instructions should be given whether they should be kept and how for how long they should be kept, that is again very, very important. That has to be conveyed to the patient. Because this is again a case for potential litigation later on. Now azithromycin. Azithromycin is again approved for bacterial conjunctivitis, used for chronic blepharitis because of it, its anticholaginetic or anti-MMP9 use. So recurrent corneal erosions, again, we can use azithromycin, but again, it is very commonly used by uh, cornea surgeons, but, but again, it is off-label. Now, doxycycline, tetracycline, oral, not meant for eye use, not meant for blepharitis, not meant for uh, chemical injuries, but we are using it. Again, it is off-label because they have, uh, they are used in uh, sub-antimicrobial dose and they have anticholaginolytic, anti-MMP9 activity and again used for chemical injuries as well as uh, blepharitis. Topical steroids, or topical steroid, difluprid. Again, it's a synthetic steroid approved for only post-surgical inflammation. We are using it left, right, and center for aritis and uveitis. All of us, you do it, but we should all know it is off-label. Gancyclovir is approved for herpes keratitis. However, a uh, lot of cornea surgeons using it for epidemic keratoconjunctivitis, adenoviral keratoconjunctivitis, and it is very, very effective, mind you. But again, it is off-label. Interferon alpha 2b. This is a, a drug which is not meant for ophthalmic use. However, cornea surgeons are using it for treatment of OSSN, specifically uh, where the OSSN is very extensive. After surgery, there is residual, uh, OS, uh, residual OSSN. There is a recalcitrant OSSN not man being managed by standard therapies, which is basically excision and mitomycin C or multifocal or diffuse lesions. Sometimes when the visual axis is involved, we prefer using interferon alpha 2b. This is very, very effective. Leads to very fast resolution. But again, it is not meant for ophthalmic use. There is a pegylated interferon alpha 2b which is, which is coming to the market, which makes the dosage uh, once in three weeks or four weeks, whereas routine interferons is basically used once in a week. Mitomycin C, the next uh, speaker will talk about it. Again, it's it's one of the most commonly used drugs in India segment, but again, most of the uses, what we are using it for is glaucoma, pterygium, epithelial growth, OSSN, again, it is off-label. It is not meant for this use. Cyclosporin, again, one of the most commonly used drugs. It is indicated only for dry eye, inflammatory dry eye, but off-label uses are multiple. We, most of us are using it in VKC, we are using it in recurrent corneal erosions, uh, chronic blepharitis, SLK, pterygium recurrence prefer, uh, prevention, we all use it. But again, we should be aware it is not indicated, it is off-label. And a lot of us are using it as steroid sparing dr uh, drug where we need the IOP to be controlled, where we there is a risk of a problem with wound healing or viral replication or development of cataract. In lieu of steroids, we use cyclosporin. But again, the use is off-label. Topical NSAIDs, ketorolac, indicated for allergic conjunctivitis and post-op. However, a lot of NDS segment refractive surgeons are using it for post-LASIC to prevent uh, overcorrection or regression. And it is used again as steroid sparing in select group of drugs. So this is again an off-label use of ketorolac which is not indicated by nor not uh, approved by FDA. CME, we use left, right and center nepaphenac. Again, it is off-label. Pain falling corneal abrasion, abrasions, again it is off-label. And dry eye disease, we don't, entire segment surgeons don't use it, but a lot of people use it for pain. But again it is off-label because it reduces inflammation. However, it is bad for ocular surface, so a lot of entire segments are not using it, but still people are using it, but it is an off-label use of this, this drug. Anti-glaucoma medication, bimatoporos, the most common 
side effect or adverse effect is lash growing it is by use it is being used by people to promote lash growing in people who don't have lashes or thin lashes so it is again a off label use it will if you go by the indications or the things we discussed starting it is will be qualified as a off label use then brimonidine this is a very important drug all of us we use it as anti glaucoma medication however refractive surgeons have been using it for a long long time to prevent bleeding after suction cap uh, in, uh, induced uh, bleeding or sometimes you have panus uh, on the cornea and for after lasik it bleeds you don't want the patient to look bad after surgery so brimonidine has been used for that another thing which has been used and been used very long is uh, post lasik uh, to pre prevent post lasik glare because of a large mesopic pupil or uh, large pupil again brimonidine has got a effect on reducing the pupil size lot of us are using in post trauma patient where we have post trauma midriasis where it works in two ways one pressure is low second thing is it constricts the pupil a little bit so again this is again a off label it is a controversial topic but we have been using it for a long time for uh, managing the pupil size to a smaller size than it is there intracameral drug this is the most important thing i wanted to talk now two major studies scar studies for cefuroxime and uh, arvind i study for moxifloxacin intracameral use has been prevalent and all of us are using it but mind you these both drugs are off label now this is we should remember though this is off label but it is part of ppp or preferred practice patterns so logically speaking if we use it we are not wrong if we don't use it then it is wrong it is off label use but it should be done so all all the cornea surgeons know whenever you have a intra uh, interface infection you have to use intracameral drugs again it is the use is off label it is not part of the uh, normal therapy so please remember fda drug panel basically they are uh, they are manipulated by the drugs company so lot of companies are not very happy in promoting their drugs and getting F fda approval for lot of indications so our aim should be we should think in the best interest of ourselves as well as the patient so if a drug is part of ppp pattern we should use it so in conclusion lot of drugs we are using almost 80 to 90% indications we are using are off label we should know about the their uses and adverse effects and we should always follow the preferred practice patterns even if the drug is off label the problem is sometimes off label use may lead to insurance rejections but legally we are not wrong if we use a drug off label if it is part of the ppp as i said it it's a difficult thing for a surgeon it's a it's not a bed of roses if you use it off label but you should use it in the best interest of yourself and the patients thank you uh, thank you dr sandeep uh, if any questions uh, no questions i uh, invite brigade sham sundar to present the the procedures which are off label in ntr segment presenter yeah, I shall be talking on anti off label procedures in the anti segment we have just heard the talk on drugs in the anterior segment which we have used which can be off label there are certain procedures also which can be termed as off label and many of them are being used i have no financial disclosure we all know what off label means when it is just got three main things which you have to think of one is the what is the indication what is the route of action and what is the dosage all three are usually specified in the prescription or the drug label 
Anything that is used other than that becomes off-label. There's a host of, I'll just brief uh, overview, right from preclinical research up to trials and then for getting up. Uh, okay, from the uh, drug regulatory authority, one must go through an investigational new drug application first, with aided with clinical research, then comes to the regulatory authority, which approves the drug for use in mass marketing, and then issues a label for the indication, the dose, and the do uh, dosage form. We already gone through this. So what is most important is, it should be a well-informed, with a firm scientific rationale and sound medical advice when you treat the patient with either a known indication or one which is an off-label. So what makes a good doctor? A one who has good medical practice, the best interest of the patient, who will require that these physicians use the legally available drugs according to the best knowledge and treatment. I'll briefly cover them under refractive and corneal procedures, lens-based surgeries, and glaucoma surgeries. We all know about corneal collagen cross-linking. It's a photochemical reaction of corneal collagen. There's a combined action of photosensitized riboflavin with ultraviolet UVA irradiation. And it stiffens our anterior cornea, corneal stroma by creating strong covalent bonds between the collagen fibrils. The approved uses when the Avedro KXL system received FDA approval in 2016 was for the indication of progressive keratoconus. In 2016, it was then approved for treatment of corneal ectasia after refractive surgery. Actually, using any other system other than the Avedro system, as per the FDA, is off-label, and any other indication is also off-label, or other types which are being, other ma machines which are being used. Now, the off-label, stable ectasia has become a more important indication nowadays, especially when you want to stabilize the cornea. Epion procedure, infective keratitis, where you have PAC or the photoactivated chromophore, uh, infectious keratitis, which helps in collagen cross-linking, as well as the microcytal activity of UV radiation to manage keratitis with stromal melt, and as a refractive procedure. CXL plus, when you, when you combine it with other procedures, you can see a host of procedures are there which are now off-label but are used increasingly as an effective method to halt the progression of not only keratoconus but also to reshape the cornea, reducing the ectasia and smoothing out the irregularities that lead to high order aberrations and astigmatism, especially the topography PTK with CXL. LASIK has been on for quite some time, and now the, we have modified procedures that combine LASIK with accelerated corneal cross-linking for the correction of refractive errors in an attempt to decrease the risk of post-operative corneal ectasia, like LASIK extra, SMILE extra, as well as PRK extra. These are all off-label indications. Intrastromal ring segments, we know, is a minimally invasive tissue-saving surgical procedure. It's been used to treat, uh, treat keratoconus as, and approved for myopia treatment way back in 1999. But studies have also shown the efficacy of ICRS in treating many other corneal conditions, such as post elastic ectasia as well as astigmatism. It's been increasingly also used as an off-label procedure in post-refractive surgery ectasia. Tissue adhesives, we know it was way back in the 1960s when they started using tissue adhesives for corneal perforations. The octyl butyl cyanacrylate has now become a standard adjunctive therapy when we treat ulcers which are going to perforate or, on in, or have perforated with small diameter. The off-label uses are small corneal perforations. You can use it for impending perforations, desmetoceles, and also for wound leaks. These are all off-label applications, but do help the patient in giving a better treatment care. Fibrin glue, you know, all of us know about fibrin glue, which is used in various parts of the body and by various surgeons. But for ophthalmology, fibrin glue has proved to be a boon as there are so many off-label indications over the last several years. You can see right starting from conjunctival surgery to strabismus, corneal perforations, 
limbal cells, uh, limbal cell transplantation, glaucoma, as well as even in VR surgery, it has been used. Coming to intrastromal injections, we know this is a different route where the drug is used. This is also as an off-label indication. And we have used bevacizumab, especially in treatment of chronic corneal neovascularization. When you want to take up patients, high-risk patients for subsequent corneal transplants, or you can use intrastromal amphotericin or voriconazole, now used for corneal ulcers, which are recalcitrant, the fungal ones, as well as moxiflox for those which are bacterial. Mitomycin C, intraoperative inject, earlier mitomycin was FDA approved as mitosol in a specific concentration and usually was sponge application was done during uh, glaucoma surgery. Now increasingly we have used, we are using intraoperative injection of mitomycin C during trabeculectomy rather than using the uh, uh, swabs. Now it is also being used with minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries and Wherever corneal haze is there, mitomycin has now been used off-label in PRK, pterygiums, and in OSS, OSSN. YAG laser. YAG laser, we know the principal uh, indications were for YAG caps as well as PIs. But you now increasing number of users are there for YAG lasers, starting from vitreolysis to cut the vitreous strands. In Malignant uh, glaucomas to disrupt the anterior hyaloid phase as well as pupillary membranes can be removed. Argon su laser suturalizers, especially when you want to take out a suture from the scleral flap in traps. Laser peripheral iridoplasty for acute angle closure has also been used. So what was the initial use has now changed to many off-label indications. In lens placed, simple ringer's lactate is still being used which is an off-label indication. Earlier it was, we usually use BSS or BSS plus, but in many area, places and many surgeons still stick to Ringer's lactate during cataract surgery. Fakic IOLs were approved only for myopia, but it's also being used for hyperopia or astigmatism so to provide satisfactory outcomes, visual outcomes, but it still remains an off-label procedure. The piggyback technique to correct refractive surprises is also another important uh, use of fakic IOLs which is an off-label indication. Refractive lens exchanges are also used, and these are also in off-label indication. Primary posterior laser capsulotomy used by the, in, in femtosecond, we also can do the primary posterior laser capsulotomy as a, to prevent PCO as an off-label indication. SFIOL itself an off-label procedure, and when you use Gore-Tex suture nowadays, that is another uh, off-label indication or use of Gore-Tex, which has usually been used mainly in cardiovascular areas. Glaucoma surgeries, trabeculectomy augmentation with bevacizumab, subconjunctival has also been tried. Mixed procedures, the FDA approval was to be used only in conjunction with cataract surgery. But now there are many persons, uh, sorry, doctors who use mixed procedures as standalone for glaucoma, moderate glaucoma, mild glaucoma, and the eye stent and uh, eye stent inject are now in clinical trials and approval is being sought for. Another area where MIX was used as off-label was to treat refractory steroid-induced ocular hypertension where the fluosinolone isotonite implants were used and could not be, the resulting glaucoma could not be treated with uh, drugs and they were used of MIX was a he very helpful indication. Drug delivery systems, we are now using drug eluting contact lenses as well as punctal plug delivery systems. They'll all be off-label, so none of them are approved, but they are being increasingly used, trials are on. So to conclude, one must be on guard for off-label use. You familiarize yourself with published literature, guidelines and experience of colleagues, acceptable standard of care, and discuss all options. Explain to patients, please, before you start them, and document informed consent for off-label use as far as possible. So one must do evidence-based practice and for the best possible results for the patients. And patient will never care how much you know until they know how much you care. Thank you for your patient listening. Uh, thank you, Brigadier Sham Sundar, for the uh, detailed uh, 
presentation on the web which all procedures are off level for the anterior segment uh, diseases of the eye uh, any questions thank you brigadier sham sundar now i welcome uh, Colonel Gaurav Kapoor to present his topic that is the off-label drugs for posterior segment diseases. Just a comment uh, till, till he starts his presentation. Most of the procedures we are doing, most of the drugs we are using are actually off-label. So that is what is being emphasized by this talk. So we should be aware of it. That's the thing. Yeah, thank you. I'll be speaking on off-label use of drugs in uh, posterior segment disorders. Uh, the generally uh, what we know is around the 1950s the intravitreal drug delivery system started uh, successful curage of endophthalmitis took in uh, place in 1944 and it became a method actually to bypass the blood retinal barrier so the basic question arose is it a safe procedure to be done now the general indications for uh, posterior segment use that we know which are being used currently are endophthalmitis, wet ARMD, CNVM, macular edema, retinal vein occlusions, uveitis, CSCR. These are generally the indications, most common indications which even uh, general ophthalmologists also do the treatment for. So intravitreal injections, it is a rapidly evolving route of medication. Uh, in 2014-15, there were 388,000 procedures, which has gradually grown up, uh, and there is a 215%. These are just figures. There has been an increase in the procedures over a five-year period. So what are the drugs used in the posterior segment? Like in the anterior segment, uh, it was antibiotics, antifungals, antivirals, steroids. There is a huge overlap. The same drugs are used in the anterior segment, and a lot of it is off-label in the posterior segment also. And the other major group is which is used for the posterior segment disease, anti-VEGF, uh, aflibercept now, and even methotrexate in the posterior segment. So the off-label drug use in posterior segment disorders, quite a few of our treatments are not FDA approved, but like has been brought out by the previous speakers, they are part of preferred practice pattern, they are site saving. Posterior segment disorders as compared to, oh, probably there are diseases which are more recalcitrant to treatment. So it actually becomes repeated use of the drugs and they end up being site saving in these drugs. What matters is the risk and benefits and how well it is known and how much research or literature is available on the topic. So it's a combination of safety and efficacy and appropriate off-label use of the drug. So use of off-label drugs, intravitreal antimicrobials, they used on endophthalmitis, none of these drugs are FDA approved for this indication. In fact, one injection can be side-saving. We all know we have faced endophthalmitis at some point or the other. This is safe to inject. What is need to remember is it is safe to inject. Your injecting this drug will not be questioned. Conversely, not treating adequately as the first line of treatment will probably lead to litigation. So this is something which is the most important, which is in the armamentarium of every ophthalmologist. You have to use it at some time or the other. But this is not FDA approved. But Converse is not using it. You will invariably land up in litigation because you have not done the first part of the PPP and expose the patient to unnecessary risks. Again, intravitreal steroids, uh, injection dexamethasone is being used to reduce inflammation, uveitis. It is an adjunct to treatment of endophthalmitis. The drug delivery system is FDA approved only for macular edema and retinal vein occlusion, non-infectious posterior uveitis and diabetic macular edema. These are the only three indications for which it is approved. So intravitreal triamcinolone acetonide, uh, it has a preservative. It is cheap and effective. And if you compare it with Ozodex, the cost is much lower but it tends to cause IOP rise and endophthalmitis, but it is still being used because of its, like I said, the cost-benefit ratio, risk ratio, if you calculate that, it is a very effective drug which can be used. Now, we all know about photodynamic therapy, a PDT with vertiporfin in 2000 initiated a new era. Now it is on the downswing. It was FDA-approved originally only for ARMD with neovascularization and pathological myopia with neovascularization. This was the only two FDA approvals given for PDT. Now, if you have a look at the 
ऑफ लेबल यूज इट हैज बीन यूज फॉर अ वाइड स्पेक्ट्रम ऑफ डिसऑर्डर्स मल्टीफोकल क्रोडाइटिस विद न्यू वैस्कुलराइजेशन पी सी वी वेसो प्रोलिफ्रेटिव ट्यूमर्स सी एस आर क्रोडल हिमेंजियोमा मेलिग्नेट मेनोमा इट इज अक्रॉस द बोर्ड फॉर अ नंबर ऑफ डिसऑर्डर्स बिकॉज द बेसिक प्रिंसिपल ऑफ ट्रीटिंग द डिजीज रिमेन्स द सेम सो एंड ह्यूज अमाउंट ऑफ लिटरेचर इज ऑल्सो अवेलेबल ऑन दिस एन एस आई डी इज लाइक इन द एंटीरियर सेगमेंट दे आर अप्रूव फॉर पेन एंड इन्फ्लेमेशन एसोसिएटेड विद कैटरेक सर्जरी बट ऑफ लेबल वी आर यूजिंग इट इन आर डेली प्रैक्टिस पोस्ट ऑफ सी एम ई मैकोलर एडीमा डायबिटिक रेटनोपैथी आर वी ओज यू वी आर टी सी एन वी एम ई आर एम द लिस्ट इज एक्चुअली एंडलेस एंड द यूज इज जनरली इंक्रीजिंग विद द न्यूअर एन एस आई डीज विच एफ कम इन ब्रोम फेनैक नेपा फेनैक सो एक्चुअली द एफ डी अप्रूवल इज नॉट देयर फॉर दीज यूजेज uveitis in which uh, cme is a site threatening condition steroids oral intravitreal injection extended release disease, uh, devices these are fda approved nsaids ivta anti vegf anti tnf alpha intravitreal methotrexate sirolimus these are all off label which are available for treatment of uveitis csr again a very common condition which we encounter on a daily basis almost in our working condition it affects the young working class uh, all these current treatments which are available for use uh, treatment of cscr or off label epilerinone spironolactone which is given orally also so these are off label uses but they are known to be effective there a lot of literature which is available and they are known to be effective in treatment of this condition so it actually helps you in expanding your treatment options especially in cases where you're not responding generally they tend to resolve on their own but now you have options available to you to treat these conditions Uh, anti vegf coming to anti anti vegf these have revolutionized the treatment of armd uh, bevacizumab is the most common and most i would say the famous drug which has been used off label for years now it is uh, macugen has fda approval for cnvm but the use in diabetic macular edema is off label ranibizumab and aflibercept these are the drugs which are now approved for uh, armd use in the posterior segment Avastin has been one of the most closely watched drugs in the world today. Everybody likes to have it in his armamentarium, but has always been mired in controversy, and it has always been off label for the last three decades or four decades that it has been used. So the indications are huge for Avastin, ARMD, macular edema, myopic choroidal neuropathy. The list is endless. The number of diseases again literature available on this. People have used it in all these conditions, and it is found to be effective. benefits are high efficacy it has a longer half life no preservative it has a higher safety dose and the major benefit to the patient is the lower cost especially in a country like ours even in uh, today's scenario with the newer anti vegfs coming and if you go to tier 2 tier 3 towns or maybe the peripheral areas of a tier 1 town this is still the preferred drug because of its cost effectiveness and wide availability but it has a number of adverse reactions uh, which are linked to other systems also costing avastin is less than 5000 rupees lucentis 17000 to 20000 aflibercept now the costs have come down but at one point it was almost 60000 so if you uh, for the patient especially in a country like ours it is a huge difference given a choice and if you explain it to the patient avastin would still be the number one drug of choice in such a scenario but we have the counterpoint the industry concerns now like kanal sandeep also said lot of it is industry driven the industry feels it is not very safe to use avastin obviously these are industry perceptions they will project it because it is a revenue loss to the industry and the question is it may be financially motivated there are views against it there are views for it but then that question always arises is it industry driven or is industry opposing avastin they have not allowed fd approval in the last 3 decades to come in because their r&d money goes down the drain coming to intravitreal combinations antibiotics antibiotic plus steroids anti vegf plus steroids we use everything in our daily practice but this is all off label combinations have a lot of problems incompatibility instability retinal toxicity procedure related issues but used in the right combination in the right indications again they have become a part of the practice pattern so actually not using them 
would more be more of an issue rather than their usage if used correctly and for the right indication and based on literature available in the uh, by other institutions or research papers so if you use it correctly it is a good combination to have in your armamentarium for treatment of various diseases intraocular risks with intravitreals are always there endophthalmitis that risk is always there Retal detachment is there traumatic cataract is there we all know of this but this is a risk which the patient is ready to take when the issue is of saving the sight now we come to sustained release implants antivirals ganciclovir is the only one which is fd approved foscarnet and sidofovir are still not approved but they are available and being studied for treatment of various conditions stem cell therapy another thing for repair restore and regeneration of dysfunctional cell long term safety graft survival biological activity these are being studies the indications are armd uh, glaucoma rp stargardt's disease but none of these right now are fd approved but lot of research is going on on these topics so the conclusion is off label use is something we have to live with and which should be available with us and should it should be based on available literature and the practice patterns so familiarize yourself with the published literature guidelines and experience and they are the accepted standards of care or preferred practice pattern so discuss all options explain to your patient what you are going to do and it is based on literature so always explain to the patient what is available this is not prescribed for this however people are using it it is known to have a benefit and document your informed consent so documentation is impo important uh, rather than there are people uh, who give intravitreal injections who just note it as an anti vege without listing out whether avastin has been given or aflibercept that is wrong consent of the patient and informing the patient of what you have used is more important will reduce chances of litigation rather than not disclosing and then facing litigation later on so evidence and not label should be the gold standard for practitioners to base their judgment when making therapeutic decisions for their patients thank you uh thank you kanal gaurav for giving a detailed presentation on the off label use of drugs in the posterior segment disorders uh, by, uh as you have, uh, must have come to know that uh, most of the procedures in the ophthalmology uh, the, the drugs or the uh the procedures are off label uh what are the legal issues related to this off label use of drugs because uh one should be very careful in now uh, present day of litigations patient might go to the courts for the adverse effects of drugs which are not uh, the fda approved or the approved by the drug controller of india to discuss about this now i invite uh, kal avinash mishra to tell about us uh, tell us about the legal issues which are related to the off label use of drugs dr avinash mishra please thank you so much sir uh, i will be uh, covering the legal issues concerned with uh, the use of uh, off label drugs uh over the last few years there has been such rapid and exciting new advances being made in the medical field that we uh, generally tend to forget that the legal issues have kept pace if not gone a couple of steps ahead of us and this is more so while we are using off label drugs so uh while using off label drugs which have become so commonly used now uh we tend to forget that the legal issues can actually be much worse and unnecessarily we might get into legal issues so i'm here to talk a little bit about what are the ways and means that we can avoid this most avoidable unnecessary legal hassles as we all are aware the use of off label drugs is not uncommon rather is become the standard of care in several ophthalmic conditions again is it legal well ladies and gentlemen it is most definitely not illegal 
as long as it is used for the best interest of the patient. Use is based on firm scientific rationale and there is firm clinical evidence to support the use of this off-label drug for that particular disease or ailment is the best option available. Now there are various global and regulatory frameworks throughout the world. In US, we have the US FDA. In Europe, we have the European Medicine Agency. While Japan, Japan is indeed very liberal because off-label use is allowed even by, without submitting any preliminary clinical data. In India, the legal definition of a drug is given by the CIDESCO, that is the Drugs and Cosmetic Act of India, which came up in 1940 and which has been continuously amended up to 31st of December 2016. The Drug Controller General of India is the regulatory authority for granting approval for new drugs in India. However, unfortunately, there are no clear-cut guidelines which have been given. Now, the Drug Control Agenda of India is the head of the CIDESCO, which regulates the drugs and devices in India. What about the pharmaceutical companies? Well, the marketing by pharmaceutical companies of off-label drugs is considered a violation of law and offense legally. So, the pharmaceutical companies cannot legally recommend the use of any off-label use of a drug. And if they do so, then they are liable for multi-million dollar fines or even face severe legal consequences. Luckily, IMA has been very supportive to us doctors because they have given in writing that the association said that doctors in India should be allowed to prescribe drugs even for unapproved indication, provided there is scientific evidence and known medical opinion to justify the use of such drugs off labeling. Now, what are the precautions which we need to keep in mind? To avoid any malpractice risk, I'll just list it out. Informed written consent, documentation, regulatory issue, insurance coverage, and ethical issues. Now, informed consent. This is the most important portion because the use of an off-label drug combined with an adverse outcome is a potential malpractice disaster. And this is there for both on-label and off-label drugs, but definitely far, far more as far as off-label drugs is concerned. Patients thus must be properly informed prior to initiation of treatment. Now, informed consent is a, not a form, it's indeed a process. We must discuss with the patients and his relatives that the drug is an off-label drug and what are the risks associated with this drug. In some situations, failure to discuss off-label therapy may indeed be treated as malpractice. Now, this is just to give you an idea what a template of an off-label drug uh, informed consent looks like. State clearly the purpose that the drug is being used for, which are the alternatives which are available to this drug, as well as its complications and side effects which are known to occur with this particular drug. Now, documentation. It is another very important thing. We as surgeons should document practically everything, including the decision-making process, the previous treatment which the patient has been on, and the, which are the other studies associated with the use of this drug. The dose and lot number of the drug needs to be mentioned and the discharge instructions should be very clearly written. Regulatory issue. This is basically a difference between investigation and medical practice. Remember, courts have held in violation of FDA regulations is a negligence per se. Insurance coverage. This is one of the most difficult aspects and what we recommend is that the individual insurance companies should do give insurance coverage on a case-to-case -case basis. 
depending on the assessment of the medical indication that the drug has been used and whether it is reasonable and necessary for treating that particular condition. Ethical issue. Now, prescription of an off-label drug should be considered ethical. When the drug is cost-effective, patient cannot afford another approved drug and there is enough safety data which exists about the use of this drug. Finally, I'd like to conclude by stating that it is indeed using off-label drugs is very common and it is legal. Sometimes we see that off-label drugs might be the only drug which might be available for treating particular ocular conditions. As long as there is proper scientific rationale, clear communication with the patient and appropriate documentation, we can think that we are relatively safe. However, there might be unexpected adverse outcomes, but then, ladies and gentlemen, is this not true for on-label drugs also? They can also suffer from complications. Now, the way ahead. What we recommend is there should be clear-cut guidelines for existing drug policy in India, and the Drug Act needs to be amended suitably to safeguard the interest of us doctors in case such a legal issue arises with the use of these off-label drugs. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Avinash Mishra. Uh, he brought about the what are the legal implications which can occur with the use of off-label off drugs or the implants or procedures. Uh, what what we should do to prevent the litigations which may be associated with the use of off-label drugs. Uh, any questions regarding the legal issues or the uh, how one can uh, prevent the litigations? Thank you, Dr. Mishra. So to uh, conclude the topic, uh, what are the avoiding uh, factors or what, what should we do to avoid the uh, legal pitfalls is continuous education. We must prescribe only those medications that are in the best interest of the patients and based on most uh, creditable scientific evidence. Then secondly, uh, with, uh, as brought about by Dr. Mishra, we must uh, take a informed consent, uh, legal and ethical duty to disclose all the facts that are required to be known by the patient uh, and his decision must be taken. Then third, as brought about by Dr. Mishra, record keeping. All off-label drug prescribing should be backed up by scientific evidence, citations, conversations with medical community members, informed consent and detailed medical case sheets must be uh, kept. Prescribers can substantially reduce the risk of legal exposure if they verify that the off-label use is supported by substantial peer reviews. It is medically necessary and no viable options are available and should not be done as a matter of experiment on the patients. As far as the off-label marketing is concerned, as brought about by the earlier speaker also, it is a violation of law in India as compared to other countries like Japan where it is uh, freely used and no legal implications are there. However, the financial aspects are involved. There have, been, there were, there have always been attempts from the pharmaceutical companies to increase the use of these drugs uh, so that they can 
gain more uh, profits however it is impractical to expect that pharmaceutical companies will restrict or stop off label use of these drugs the to conclude off label uh, use of drugs gives freedoms to the freedom to the physicians to apply the new therapeutic options based on the latest evidence our physicians must uh, lawfully prescribe approved drugs for any use consistent with the available scientific data and proper medical practice sometimes patients suffering from terminal illness demand new approach or new treatment and if their logical demands are rejected it will definitely not benefit the newer patients it has been uh, recommended that attempts should be made to strike a balance between the uh, cost uh, the uh, the advantage which the patient can have and the side effects which the drug can cause off label use might be compared to uh, double edged sword which are at one end might be very useful for some patients while it may cause experimentation for others a uh, proper off label prescribing should only be encouraged by the distribution of truthful and non misleading information and if any off label prescribing is disallowed many new therapies and evidence would not come into practice and newer drugs may not be uh, discovered or invented so uh, 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 off label drugs are uh, useful uh, for the uh, newer treatments uh, off label uh, drugs use of drugs have several advantages and therefore the government uh, should give uh, consent uh, to use of them with the legal uh, uh, permission so to conclude Uh, the off label use of drugs one should be well informed should have a firm scientific rationale and should have sound medical evidence we had has been brought out clear cut guidelines must exist for existing drugs protocols to be formulated by drug regulatory agency like drug regulatory uh, drug controller of india in india for avoidance or acceptance of off label use for the newly discovered molecules drugs also should be amended suitably to deal with legal issues if they arise thank you so much uh, any questions regarding this topic it is actually a topic which uh, all of all the medical practitioners should know to avoid any the uh, legal issues which may arise because nowadays the patients and the lawyers they try to take out different things from the treatment part and uh, we all are amenable to litigations and uh, contempt of court and all those things are available any questions if there are no questions i thank my colleagues the for the the elucid detailed presentation of various Uh, drugs and the procedures which are off label and the legal issues which can arise and how to prevent the legal issues thank you thank you so much